Yes. Please. Um, it's really a question on the last point you said about um, the chief Nirvana or Nirvana in Bali. Yeah. And you said that there's nothing else to be felt. Right. So when, when we're in, when we eventually reach that state, do we still know things? So in that state, everything stops, right? So the feeling, the perception, everything stops in that state. But that state only lasts for a period of time. It might be only a second or it could be much longer. Mm. I mean, I have no experience, so I can't tell uh, you from my experience, but as I understand from people I have met and talked to, it can be any length of time. But it's when you come out afterwards that you come back to the body and the mind, and then you realise that something stopped, and that the mind can stop. Not only the body can stop, but the mind can stop, and that is bliss. And so when you come back, you experience that, and then the body and the mind continue as usual, based on their past karma, so based on uh, whatever mm. you know conditioning you have in there, which will be pretty good <laughs> if you if you fit to you know experience nibbana, then you've got a lot of uh, wholesome karma, and uh, and so you'll come back to the world. But I think one of the things that I've noticed in the people I have confidence in, in having experienced this, is that their whole focus in life changes from one of self orientation to one of loving kindness and just service, just a wish to serve, mm. but not a service with wishing to have anything in return at all, just serving for the sake of serving, because that's all they mm. can really, that's all there is for them to do, you know, and it's just such a natural thing. Mm. So they tend to spend their whole lives teaching and serving others. Yeah. And it's very beautiful, you know, when you experience that kind of loving kindness that really asks nothing in return. So, so that's the state after no fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, this it only lasts a short time. Isn't the state of no feeling a bit like very deep dream of sleep or almost like being a piece of dead wood or <laughs> Yeah. Like I don't think it's like being a piece of dead wood. I mean, as I say, you know, these things have to be experienced mm. to really understand, and I think the Buddha also shied away from speaking about them. I mean, what he did say mm. in that sutta, the, the answer was that the reason it's bliss is because so much suffering has ceased. Mm. So it is, a it is a sense of bliss. I mean, I don't think it's saying there's nothing. No. There is a sense of bliss. But the thing is that at the end of your life, you will then enter into Parinibbana. If you're fully enlightened, there will be an ending altogether of, of life and death, mm. and birth and life and death. And so at that time, everything ends. Yeah. 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 <coughs> but he wouldn't, he wouldn't really say what that's <coughs> like. Because to speak in terms of it being a feeling or a state is to speak in worldly terms. And this is something mm. very, very different. Something beyond that. Mm. But I think it's good. And that's why it's important to start developing happiness early on, because then you have mm. confidence that it's leading in a good direction. Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> you said a lot of things that help me understand the struggle I had in the meditation. Like your parents watching the news and so on. The news might have been in him and been jailed for life because together they were about having wise friends, you know, and the need for spiritual companions, because 
we do need to be able to gather with groups of people who can discuss the other reality as well and ways of resourcing ourselves to, you know, to cope with the suffering that's in the world. I mean, the suffering that's in the world can also be a trigger for the spiritual search. And part of my um, kind of existential crisis, or whatever you call it, as a teen, was seeing the news, you know. I remember seeing the news and just feeling devastated that there could be so much greed and violence and power, you know, in the world happening. And, and I just felt like the weight of all that on my head, even though it wasn't my personal suffering. I just thought, how can anyone bear this, you know? And what's the point of life if that's what there is? And then when I heard that the Buddha did say, yes, there's suffering, and it's to be understood, for the first time it gave me a sense that there could be something I can do with that, you know, that I could maybe use that suffering um, as a way to look for a way out, but also to develop compassion. But yeah, to, to develop the compassion, you need to have enough time out, because if your mind's always, you know, just pulled down by all of that, you, you're, you're just being pulled into the suffering yourself. You're allowing that suffering to contribute even more suffering in the world. So it's difficult, but I think we have to be quite gentle with ourselves. Because the other thing is that we can become uh, quite inured to it. You know, so we read stuff and we just feel numb. We don't even feel the suffering of the news anymore. And that's also really quite unhealthy. So I think, you know, it's good to still feel... But because you are a deeply feeling person, don't overwhelm yourself with it and keep taking that step out to resource. And even the meditation, where the meditation is largely looping around, you know, your thoughts are looping around that, it's, it's worthwhile because they are calming down. You're processing. You know? Otherwise, you can go around with these thoughts for a long time, operating unconsciously, and they just make you in a bad mood and you don't even know why. You know, but at least when you sit with it, there's a chance to see it and, you know, maybe yeah, moderate the amount that you are exposed, if that helps. Yeah. It heavy. Yeah, it's heavy, it's heavy. It is heavy. Yeah. It is heavy. I mean, one of the things that I find helpful when there's a lot of heaviness or suffering is to widen my mind. Because I don't know if you notice, but when things are heavy, I notice that my mind gets kind of pulled down with that and sort of contracted and I feel sort of mm, inward. And if I just expand my awareness to perhaps the outsides of my body or even the atmosphere, there's a little bit more space to hold that feeling. It's like another way to work with bodily feelings. You know, so you're not always in the centre of where it's difficult, but you have a sense of perspective around it. Yeah. And again, and also to give it kindness. Like, okay, I'm suffering, you know. How can I be with that? It's okay to feel depressed. It's okay to feel hurt, you know, or helpless. But how can I hold that in a way that's kind? Like, how can I bring gentleness to that? You feel what, sorry? I feel that it's my husband, because you know about my husband. And uh, it can be so overbearing, you know, that I could explode. And then, literally, and then what I do is I clean myself back to my room. And I just do a breathing meditation, in and out, you know, totally relax. And I really calm down. And I just realize, it's not for me. Because you feel like it's, it's you as well, because, you, as you say, you put it in. One way is to give things more space. Another is to just meet them, you know, but taking the tools of compassion and kindness. Mm -hmm. 
another way is to actually change things, you know, like you came here instead of seeing the news. So you had a change of scene, and sometimes that's good too, because you get a different perspective. And sometimes, you know, you can focus on the good things in life too. That's why the Buddha taught the four Brahma Viharas. So he taught compassion, right, to help us to meet the difficult things, the painful things. But he also taught mudita, which is often not um, practiced very much, which is to rejoice with other people's happiness. Yeah, because the news always pulls out the things that are the most shocking, the most, you know, extreme. But imagine how many other wonderful things must also have happened today, like really wonderful things would have happened, you know, people doing extraordinary acts of kindness. I remember one thing I saw a long time ago, actually, on uh, Facebook, which was quite... I had to go on Facebook. This is my little excuse now, but I have to go on that to promote my project because I don't like it. But sometimes you get these gems, and this one was um, a man standing on a bridge, I think, in London, and he was uh, about to commit suicide, but people found him in time, and they grabbed his legs through the bridge, and they were just holding onto his legs for dear life, and they'd actually wrapped some ropes and things around this man. And there was a whole crowd of people standing there holding him. And they talked him around, you know, and they held him so firmly for, I think, a number of hours until he came back over that bridge and that was his start of his new life, you know. It's amazing, no? There are these things also happening. (laughs) So we don't know. I think our little project is quite good too because, I I mean, it's a lot of work but one of the things that I'm quite amazed by is that pretty much everybody coming through the door is there to try to practice kindness. It seems to be at the forefront of people's intention. And there's just so much shared joy and kind of articulation of that as well, you know, actually practicing kind words and words of gratitude and appreciation. It's really wonderful. I don't think there's ever been an argument an actual argument in the house. It's great. And that is, it provides a place of safety and and kindness for people. Even it's tiny, but it's my bit, you know, it's what I can try to do. We can all do something. Even if it's just ensuring, I mean, one of the things that um, watching the news when I was a teenager did was to make me feel so strongly about or against the kind of evil things that can happen that I just thought, I want to make sure I don't have any of any possibility in my mind to ever behave that way, you know. Because those people are suffering really deeply. I mean, the delusion and the hatred and the confusion, you know, is so deep. I mean, imagine, if not the suffering they already have, the suffering they're going to have, <laughs> you know. I don't believe people do that in a peaceful state of mind when their life's going well, you know. And I just determine that I'm, I want to get rid of any trace of, you know, that potential to behave that way in my own heart. At least we can learn what not to do from other people. <laughs> yeah. When you were saying about the um, suffering of people with their jobs and things, and I just, it came to me about um, teenagers where there is body image. Mm. I haven't got much of a body image. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I guess it's too early to say whether there'll be things specific to that, but that's a really good point, actually. I mean, maybe it'd be nice to do something for teenagers. I always feel a lot of empathy with teenagers because I really suffered going through my hormonal changes. It was horrible. I actually didn't have too much of a thing with body image. I suppose I like to look nice, but my family were quite cool about body and stuff like that. And I guess I didn't read too many magazines, but there was certainly a lot of other suffering. You know, like, why on earth am I here? Who who bothered to have me? Why did they bother to have me? (laughs) What's the point of it all? It's really, really hard as a teenager. And they are exposed to so much kind of media, and especially nowadays, actually, with these uh, mobile phones. I guess even getting them to a group like this and asking them to turn the phone off would be quite an achievement. (laughs) But yeah, I think it's important for them to have um, role models too, you know, and people who say, oh, actually, you look great, and look at me, I've got plenty of... I'm happy, I I enjoy my food. (laughs) 
Yeah. Sometimes it just takes one or two other people to show a different way. If the whole society is moving in the same way, it can be easy to get sucked in. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, where to start? I guess in our tradition for Buddhist uh, nuns, there aren't many monasteries and there isn't the possibility for them to take the full ordination. So if you want to live according to the training that the Buddha laid down in the uh, early suttas, which is to live a life of simplicity as an alms mendicant and to you know, depend on the goodness of others, so basically on the charity of others, as a step you know, towards the... Uh, that supports the practice. There aren't many opportunities to do that. And so um, my teacher, I ordained in Burma in 2006, and then I didn't get the chance to practice, uh, to take the full ordination. But I got all the conducive conditions to meditate and to you know, live as a nun. But after I left there due to ill health, I found that there wasn't really anywhere for me to go because most nuns depend on family or friends to help them because there's no actual systemic structure that supports nuns. It only supports monks. So it was really, really difficult, and for several years I had nowhere to go. Um, but I came in contact with my teacher and eventually managed to get to Perth, um, and then a couple of years later managed to take the full ordination so that I was fully supported as an equal to any of the monks. And the other advantage of that was that we had our own community, so the monks are usually the dominant ones if the monks and nuns live together because they tend to be, there are more of them, they're more senior, and... It's just the way that these patriarchal systems work, you know, and maybe the way society works in general. So my teacher specifically tried to develop two separate monasteries so the nuns could have their own place. And um, I think that's really important, you know, because I think that women have a slightly different approach to the practice. And, uh, yeah, even some men prefer to come and speak to women about certain things, you know. But certainly for women, I think, a lot of the time, there's uh, it's refreshing, you know. They may feel safer, they may feel they can talk about things they wouldn't talk to with monks. Um, and of course, everybody, whether male or female or anything else, you know, gender, non-binary, we all have our own ways of discussing and understanding the Dhamma. So we need more places. Yeah, we need diversity, a lot of diversity. So I'm starting the first place ever, basically, for women in England to live and take full ordination. But it is really a grassroots thing, so it could take many years. But, uh, yeah, I'm in Oxford at the moment and uh, looking for people to volunteer in all kinds of capacities. And, you know, people can come and stay, come for the evening, join a meditation, join a, a discussion. Yeah, so we've got some leaflets at the back which have our contacts. So if you're interested, yeah. And will this new... Will it start off in... <coughs> It is starting off in Oxford, yeah. So we've been there like since January, but uh, next year we're continuing the lease. So it's just like a rented terrace house at the moment. Um, but we, yeah, we're going to sign the contract for another uh, until next June, okay, so and then take it from there. Yeah, there's a little house. I mean, it's modest, but we can have about eight people for a dinner evening. And uh, once it grows, you know, once I feel like it's too small, then we can think about getting something bigger. But still in Oxford? I don't know. That's the bit we don't know, because I'd like to be more loyal. Yeah, okay. I'd like it to be further afield, in the tradition of the forest monastics. You know, it's no, nice no, no, to no. live in the countryside. Well, it could be Devon, but no. I, I know that Devon's very south, so I don't know, really. I mean, it could even be Oxfordshire. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's a lot more expensive, so... We'd have to see what we find at the time. I have a feeling when I see a place, I'll, I'll, I'll know. But at the moment, the thing that's stopping us going forward is that I'm the only one on the ground, so I'm doing all the admin and the running of the project and, and the teaching and the hosting guests, and just it's just a big job, organising events and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I need a bigger team on the ground in order to move more rurally. Yeah. Also because I depend on people feeding me. So, in Oxford, it's easy for people to come, but if I'm in Devon, it might not be so easy. So, yeah, yeah, so. Step by step, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> and men can come and stay, too. It's not only that women can come. Yeah. So for everybody. <laughs>
going on any negatives. I think the education system, unfortunately, one of the flaws is yeah. you have this strong, you're supposed to have quite a strong discipline structure and it, and it lends itself to negatives, so I was trying to find the balance. Yeah. Having said that, when you've got quite a few people and you might have had a previous ne negative lesson, say, or class, it's, it's really hard to sort of have a clean state, start fresh, and, and and it sort of reminded me that there is that desire. I should, yeah. I should do things maybe so quick to sort of right. point out a fault or failure yeah, or yeah. discipline. Great. And, and my expectations were to feel mm -hmm. unhappy, and then the, that unhappiness spreads further back. Yeah. It becomes a sort of vicious, vicious circle. Vicious circle, yeah. 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 But yeah. it sort of reminded me that. Oh, uh, yeah. So tomorrow's mm. going to be very Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Good. If you have any nice teaching, I'll pick up the lead that I'll have to use some of that. Okay, cool. Great, yeah, yeah. There are some nice YouTube ones. I listened to one this morning. Oh, really? <laughs> uh. I want to say thank you as well. Um, I've been meditating on the breath for many years. Oh. And uh, you said something earlier about welcoming the breath. Yeah. And then something you said afterwards, I can't remember, but that really penetrated. Uh, mm. It really made the quality. Took me years to get that instruction too, because I, I I started with um, Goenka, so we always had this thing about if the mind wanders, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back, and I could watch about two breaths and I bring it back, bring it back, and oh, as soon as we got on to day four, which was when you went into the body sensations, I was so relieved. <laughs> I didn't have to be with this rotten breath. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because it felt like a kind of combative sort of approach, like I've got to master this breath, I've got to like. I've heard you just say before, well, it's really Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, sometimes it's well, just... What you said well, I said something about, like, a friend, as if a friend's come to stay, or you wouldn't, like, control it. You'd try to welcome it and let them go when they want to, something yeah, like that. Okay. Which is the people teach uh, breath work? Yeah, I think that's right, but is it, I think the Buddha did give some guidelines for when it may be good to share that, and one of the things he said was that it must be the right time, and I think by right time he meant right time for both people, so it's not only that I feel it will be good for that person to know, but is that person ready and receptive, ready to receive this, you know, or is that person feeling already quite got at or quite, you know, under the weather or stressed in their life, you know, and it might not be the best time, or maybe they're, it's in public and, and it'll embarrass them, you know. Um, so I think choosing the right time is really important. And then another thing he said was that um, to do it motivated by metta, so genuine loving kindness. So I think for that it does mean really trying to wait until any irritation or anger subsides and, and come at it in a really kind way. So the motivation is metta, love and kindness, but also you come at it and you use speech that's gentle. So, you know, because you can say, well, I have metta for you, I'm shouting at you out of metta, but it's like, that's not really gentle. So it should be gentle. <laughs> you know, because people really notice criticism much more than they notice praise. Yeah. 
there was some study done and it said something like, uh, criticism takes two seconds to go in. And I reckon we can even take praise as criticism too. So that's like instant. But praise takes about 20 seconds to register. And I don't know if you've experienced it, but when I try and tell people positive things about themselves, <laughs> such as my dear housemate who is uh, very wonderful in all respects and knows that, but when it comes to her paintings, oh my goodness, I have to say how wonderful they are many times. Many times. <laughs> many, many times. <laughs> So, you know, sometimes it takes time. Uh, so, yeah, another method my teacher uses is called the sandwich method. So before something slightly difficult, you say something positive, then one little tiny thing, and then, and then something positive again. So all these are ways to approach it well. Yeah. yeah. The edible sandwich. The edible sandwich, yeah. <laughs> Not like loads and loads of good stuff and then toxic poison in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe just a piece of celery or something. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, I could take one more question, but then we'll need to close. So, uh, if there's any last comment, question, complaint, I haven't had any complaints. I don't mind. <laughs> Okay. I'd just like to say a thank you to you because there's been a lot of things to think about, but two things in particular is um, firstly the, the way you talked about the inner voice, mm. which is, um, you know, you probably shouldn't have done that, or you, know, you could have done that better, or and constantly. Mm. And instead of having that developing, different type of people yeah. Yeah. that will say, you know, well perhaps you have to have that sort of, not questions that you've had, but to balance it, yeah. but to encourage yes. a voice to say, yeah. well that, you know, yeah. Yeah. take that into account. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, in schools, again, to refer back to what you shared about education, it's been shown that punishment doesn't work as well as encouragement, you know. Encouragement works the best. And it's the same with ourself. It's the same with ourself. You know, we have to say, oh, you're doing really well, you know. Yeah, you got a bit angry, but that's better than before. Mm, mm. And focusing on their strengths, because everyone has some strength or another, and, you know, when we only see what's wrong with them, and the education system, of course, is fairly narrow because it's looking at passing certain exams and subjects, right? But they might be really excellent at textiles or, I don't know, technology or sports or anything else. They don't necessarily have to be academic. Um, Yeah, but sometimes the good part gets ignored or not seen, and then that's very frustrating. If that person feels they're much more than that, but they're not... No one's noticing that. Yeah. And the same for ourselves, right? We don't notice our strengths. We don't notice them. It was also, I think you, you mentioned about looking over your day mm-hmm. and recognising um, where you had shown kindness or yeah. when, you, when you did do something positive. Definitely. And yeah. Um, yeah, celebrating that in your Yeah, family. yes. Because we have to use the same approach with ourselves. Like, we can't say, oh dear, I'm looking at the bad side of that person, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. It's like, no, it's great, I've got the intention to look at the good side of that person. That's really wonderful, that's a really noble intention. You know? yeah. Look at it that way instead. Yeah. One of our teachers uh, who comes out two years from India, it was June, uh-huh. September, uh-huh. he says the most valuable teaching he ever had was about this end of day review. It's used quite a lot now in, um, I think, psychology, but just anything you read anywhere, they do these gratitude practices. And one thing I read about recently was uh, to write down three things that you're grateful for, then to express appreciation to somebody. This is every day, right? So every day, three things that you're grateful for, either the first thing or last thing. Express one thing that you appreciate in someone to someone, and then 
while you're looking in the mirror, brushing your teeth or whatever, you reflect on something in yourself that you're grateful for or you notice one of your strengths, mm -hmm. something like that. So just these small things, I think, can bring more happiness to our lives. They sound like nothing, but they're really powerful. I did the reflecting on the three things last year when I was going through a lot of irritation with the system in the monastery. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, I should be grateful for this, this, this. And, and, you know, there is actually always something that you are genuinely grateful for. It's just that you've forgotten because you're in a bad mood. On that, you ask, <laughs> yeah. you were irritated with something within the monastery, yeah. the mechanics of it. Well, I think it's yeah. Like, is there a benefit in withdrawing from that, either mentally or physically? Yeah, I, actually at one point I did uh, not really go over to the main monastery for two whole weeks. That wasn't really because I was irritated, but it was because I needed to just go more inward, you know, mm. and not be triggered by this particular thing. So, yeah, I think that was part of it. That wasn't the main part of it, mm. but it was helpful. Yes. It was definitely helpful. And in that time I also got to practice metta towards actually everybody in the monastery. Because I realised that any amount of like slight irritation, it was to do with the system being quite, you know, male dominated. I have to go at the back of the queue basically, even though I'm senior to like most of the monks by now. <laughs> so then I just brought up every monk's qualities, like and all the little things they've done and the ways that they're kind, and also the fact that they suffer from that system too. Because it's not nice to sort of, I don't think it's nice to sort of go from being very respectful to a non to the next day going ahead of them. Mm. And then starting to feel a bit puffed up and starting to forget mm. that, you know, perhaps that nun might even have something to offer or you could talk to them or, mm. you know, it's actually not very healthy for them either. Mm. So, yeah, so that kind of brought more balance to the situation and it made it much less personal. Because mm. often these things, we take them personally and that's when we really suffer. So. Because when I got from UK earlier, uh, my interpretation was what, what you were saying is you can end up being treated like a doormat. Mm. When you're saying that, it, you know, unless you react or you, you yeah, stand your ground. Just, or, just, you know, you, you could be you could be hurt by something somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't think that has to be a negative thing. Mm. I, I think you can frame it in a positive way. Yeah. Uh, it also depends on the trust you have with that person. Like, if it's a really good friend, then they already know. Like, I had a good friend stay with me recently, and she knew that she could speak to me about something that was uncomfortable. So she said, I want to tell you that I do feel a bit uncomfortable because I'm coming as a friend, and I don't want to feel I have to cook for you because you're a nun, and I feel uncomfortable. She didn't say, you're making me uncomfortable. She said it in a way that was, like, really... It, I could see the courage it took, and I could see the vulnerability yeah. that it took, and I felt, like, really grateful that she could share it. So even though I felt a bit awkward initially, I was like, I am really happy you've told me, and yeah. basically just please do it when you want to, and otherwise, you know, that's fine. Mm. And then she said, well, now I will, because I just, you know, I just needed to say it. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on the so, relationship and on how you <coughs> express it. So with food, yeah. you can only eat what you're given. Yeah. yeah, but someone can ask what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I can't cook and I can't uh, shop. That's the main thing. But if it's absolute emergency, I mean, I could put something in the microwave or in the oven, you know. It's just that we're not supposed to get involved with food because the whole idea of monastic life is that you are available for people. And if you would be able to grow your own vegetables and cook for yourself and use money, then no one could see what you're up to and there wouldn't be any obligation to meet people and to teach people. So it's this reciprocal relationship that has kept the Sangha alive actually since the time of the Buddha and it's a very beautiful thing because it's a participatory offering, you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> Good. I don't want us to get kicked out or charged no, no, extra. No, 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 no. Oh, there's no danger. Okay. All right. Well, all right. I could take one last thing if need be. Otherwise, we should close. Do you do a dedication at the end of your practices? Or? Uh, uh, I mean, yes, I could do whatever, really. No, it's not a case of having to. It's, no, it's, no, I enjoy whatever. 
Um, yeah, I could do that. I mean, I don't have a traditional formulation for that, but I could do that and then I could chant a blessing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So at the end of this beautiful Dhamma meeting and sharing that we've experienced, I'd like to first encourage us to dedicate all the peace and the happiness that's arisen in our hearts right back to ourselves. Because we deserve our own peace, we deserve happiness, we deserve our own respect and care. So may we dedicate the goodness of this evening to ourselves for the sake of purifying our own mind and heart. May we also share that peace, that harmony and happiness with everybody in this room who all struggle in their own ways, who all strive to be the best version of themselves they can be and to bring that goodness into the world. May they be supported May they feel held and cared for by our spiritual friendship. May all those beings who are lonely, who haven't heard the Dhamma, who are lost, who are involved in harmful actions, and all those people who are hungry or starving or in parts of the world where there are wars may all those beings and any other beings who are suffering also receive the blessings of this meeting tonight and may it help to lift their hearts to lift their spirits and show them their own potential their own potential for happiness for freedom and for peace. <clears throat> so now I'll chant a blessing, spreading metta to all beings, that's loving kindness. So while I'm chanting, you can just listen to the words or notice the sensations in your own body, maybe in your heart. And imagine sharing those thoughts with all beings. Sapesata Sape Pana Sape Buddha Sape Pukala Sape Atta Bawa Pariyapana Sapa Just sit quietly for two minutes, then I'll ring the bell to end. 